this morning. My name is Shane Freeze. I'm the teaching pastor, and I have uh, Gary and Craig here. Um, why don't you guys introduce yourself briefly and what you do here at the church? Uh, I'm Gary Baker. I'm one of the elders here. And I'm Craig Merrith. I'm also one of the elders here. Awesome. Well, I appreciate uh, them being willing to come and join us and uh, dialogue with me through the text today. Uh, we're going to be in Mark, still Mark chapter 9, and continue um, our walk through that passage. We have a couple of uh, key things that we wanted to share with all of you, uh, just as far as information goes today. Um, and so I've asked Craig if he would give us an update on the youth ministry. Okay. So youth group tonight, it'll be from 5.30 to 6.30. And unlike other youth groups, you actually get to use your phones. So the way that you're gonna do that is you can download the app. Um, it's free, it's the, called Zoom. So look for Zoom on the, the App Store. And uh, everything is there for an explanation. And you can, if you have any problems, you can give Travis a call. Awesome. I also want to invite you to join us Wednesday night. Um, we are going to continue our Wednesday nights uh, at 6 o'clock. We begin our service and uh, look forward to just a time of gathering, uh, being reminded about what God's doing and encouraging one another in the Word, in prayer, uh, and fellowship together. And I also want to remind everybody to please email us the, the God at Work stories that you're experiencing uh, as we're going through this time, as we're, as we're watching God work and as the church begins to really put feet to the ground in serving our communities, serving our neighbors, and being the light of the world, the good news in the midst of difficult times. Um, we've had some people asking about um, offering, how do we get our offering in? And so I've asked Gary to kind of update us on the, the ways in which you can do that. Yeah, so we, we've got uh, several ways to do this. Uh, electronically, you can do it uh, through the app. Um, and I, I've got another note here that says online. I, I think Web that's through the well. app, though, right? That's, yep. So uh, the uh, Liberty Lake Church app has a uh, push pay on it where you can give that way. Or you can also mail an offering in to uh, P.O. Box 189, Liberty Lake. Zip code is 99019. That address is also on the website. If you don't remember it, you don't have to be scrambling to write this down. Uh, but uh, we have had some questions about that. And, uh, you know, we are doing fine, but the bills continue. So uh, we'd appreciate uh, your continued faithfulness with that. Awesome. I've asked Gary to open us in prayer. And then um, we have the privilege of singing some songs together again this morning with Travis. Uh, and so we're going to continue at this time with that. Would you mind yeah, opening us? You bet. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you so much that we uh, have this opportunity to gather uh, even remotely and uh, fellowship together, Lord, and uh, use this as a time for us to uh, be mindful of each other's needs. Uh, and also, Lord, thankful for your grace and your um, continued uh, care for us in this time. Uh, we pray, Lord, for uh, for this nation and for this um, virus that's going around. That uh, you would give us uh, give us all um, a spirit of helpfulness with each other. Uh, watch those in our community, Lord, and um, we ask that you give wisdom to those that are researching and trying to find ways to fight this thing. Uh, most of all, Lord, we know that you are in charge, and uh, your sovereign power is uh, is the greatest thing we have. We thank you, Lord, for that knowledge. Um, we pray for a quick end to this uh, situation so that people can get out of their homes and interact with each other on a normal basis again. Um, so as we go forward, Father, we, uh, we know that you're in control. Uh, we know that, uh, that you have this, and we thank you for that. Uh, thank you for all the blessings that you give us, and... Uh, we look forward, Lord, to the day that, that we can be back together and worshiping you as a body in this place. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Won't you join me as we sing, Here I Am to Worship. Bow down here I am to 
to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly and glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake. To see my sin upon that cross Now never know how much it costs To see my sin upon that cross So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. You're wonderful to me. thousand times I fell, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. My heart and my soul. Lord, I give you control, consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace, to love you from the inside out, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out. Oh, my soul cries out, Lord. You are of all else my purpose remains the art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending 
Your glory goes beyond all fame. Yeah, my heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from me inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out of my soul. Cries out, Lord. My heart and my soul. Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your life will shine in all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out of my soul. Cries out from the inside out of my soul. Cries out from the inside out of my soul. Cries out. Father God, we just ask that um, you would just consume us from the inside out, that uh, every part of our spirit would become unified with your spirit and this uh, sanctifying process. Um, and it is a process, Father, being sanctified. Um, it only comes by your Holy Spirit. Um, you are the agent of change. And uh, Jesus, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I was going to dismiss the kids. Yeah. <laughs> Probably Could shouldn't do that right now. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, man, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Travis. What a privilege it is uh, to actually get to sing and do music. I was thinking as we were going through the process, one of the things that I'm missing, one of the things that has grabbed me this morning was just how quiet it, it is here, and that's not, that's not the nature of our gatherings anymore. Right. And and how how much noise and hearing the laughter and hearing the conversations how much I miss that interaction and and people being here so um, it is a challenge and I'm sure all of you are facing uh, different dif difficulties I really appreciated uh, the Facebook uh, post that I read the other day my bride and I laughed pretty hard uh, because the the poor gal that was homeschooling her kids said first day of of class. Two children were sent to detention, and one teacher was fired for uh, for harsh treatment of children. And so I thought to myself, man, that would have been my bride back in the days when she was homeschooling our four little boys. Um, it was quite a uh, difficult thing, I believe. I wasn't there. So it was. I'm sure it was very challenging. Well, welcome again, and thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, at Liberty Lake Church. We are thrilled to be with you. Uh, we obviously miss all of you and seeing you this morning and, and hearing and laughing with you and, and sharing the stories, um, but thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm excited about the text that we're in. We're still in Mark. We're going to go ahead and continue through Mark chapter 9. Um, and uh, did, did it ever make your guys' lives better when, when your parents said things like, um, you know, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you? Or this is for your good um, when, when they were giving you chores or correcting behavior or even bringing discipline. Um, did that ever really encourage you guys as children? 
core. Not as children. Yeah, not, not, <laughs> right? As, as children, we just don't quite grasp that concept very well. But as parents, we really we start to understand that where where we're we're really concerned about the health and the 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 life of our children and their outcome and where they're heading. And so in that moment, we engage them with discipline and other practical tools of education and learning that we as our, even as adults don't particularly like. Um, we like to call them opportunities for growth. It makes it a little bit more spiritual, I guess. Um, may, and I, I don't know, in my head at least, I think it's a little easier to, to take it and to accept it. But I think we're going to see some of that kind of idea here as, as Mark is wrapping up uh, this, this story along the lines of uh, not causing the little ones to sin and, and the whole illustration we had last week of cutting off your hands, taking sin seriously. Um, and, and he ends in that passage uh, with this idea of salt and fire and, and the value of it in our lives. And so we're going to wrestle with that a little bit today um, in Mark chapter 9. Um, would you turn with me? Hopefully you have your Bibles out. Would you turn with me in your Bibles? If you need a notepad, something to write down notes, please do that. Or you could take advantage also. We actually have the um, the, the notes, the, the uh, small outline online. You can go onto our website and actually print that up. You'll see sermon notes at the top. Uh, when you when you pull up the online our webpage, it'll say sermon notes right up on the top of the of the banner there, and you can print those up and follow along with us. Um, one of the other things I, I just wanted to encourage you to do, too, um, if you are uh, following along with us today, um, I want to ask you this question as we start, and you can you can chime in and put it on our Facebook page as we go through. But would you share with us one highlight that has happened this week that is something that you've noticed about your family, something that you're grateful for that maybe you hadn't seen before because you haven't you haven't had time at home, you haven't been... Uh, you know, taking the breaks, or you just haven't, you haven't realized all of the things that you, the comforts and the blessings that we had that we just took for granted. Um, so would you uh, light up our Facebook page or send us emails or something along that line as you think about what those things are that you're thankful to God for today? Um, and that, that would just encourage us and we can encourage one another with those things as well. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Mark chapter 9. We're going to pick up the same passage we had last week. We're going to read the whole thing, Mark. Chapter 9, verse 42 is where we're going to begin. Mark 9, verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now, depending on what translation you have, you may have noticed that uh, thereafter the everyone will be salted with fire. Um, I think you had a reference, didn't you, from another translation, yeah, Gary? Yeah. Um, well, the, the references I found, it didn't give me a specific translation, but it said that several other uh, documents will add and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. So verse 49 becomes, for everyone will be salted with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. You know, the thing I love about that particular text and the fact that they added that there was in our discussion last week, um, as we were, at, I think it was at the elder meeting, we were actually talking about this text, mm -hmm. and the, that actually came up in the discussion about the sacrificial system that where they were using that salt and preparing sacrifices. Um, and, and so one of the things that is amazing when we think about the context of this, the people that were reading Mark's writings, especially there at the time, the Jews at the time, would really understand the sacrificial system. They would have, they would have connected those dots um, pretty, pretty easily. Um, where we might have a little bit harder time connecting that dot and seeing that. So when we read that portion of the text, when we take this idea of everyone will be salted with fire, I think we have to hold in 
in our hearts and in our minds, this idea of sacrifice, this per- preparing a sacrifice to be given to the Lord, to be actually used in worship of God. Um, and so it really changes, in, in my heart at least, in, in the application process, it changes that idea of everyone will be salted with fire. And that's where we're going to start this morning. Um, I titled the ser- or the, this our discussion, I keep wanting to say sermon, and maybe it is, we'll, we'll see when we get done if I've preached and if you guys had a chance to say <laughs> anything today. Um, but the reality is, is that the fire is coming. Um, and it's interesting how, depending on where we're at in our lives, we, we each see the fire as something different, this, this idea of, of tribulation or persecution or something along, along that line. But I want to look for just a minute at what the Bible says about this fire that's coming, of the idea of fire and how God uses it in the text, because I think it's really important for us to see the value of it. The first thing, our first point is everyone will be salted with fire. That statement comes from Jesus. It's specifically to his disciples, and it's encouraging them, I think. It's encouraging them that they're going to be prepared for worship. They're going to be prepared to meet the Lord as they go through this process, that on our earthly visit, on our earthly time, uh, Jesus is going to prepare us as his children to meet the Lord and to be with him. Um, and I love the idea that we're going to be prepared to be given in worship of him. I always, sometimes, you know, I get lost in the sacrificial system at times thinking that it's, it's part of how they paid for their sin. And it was, but it's the, it was the worship of God that, that happened at these moments. And, and that's what our lives are being prepared for. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, when we see it that way. So even the difficult things, even the salting and, and, and the, the persecution or the trials that we face are designed to prepare us for worship of God. Um, the first thing that we see as we think about fire, one of the first things that grabbed me was 1 Corinthians, Paul. I love Paul's writing when we get to this stuff because he's just so gentle on the church. And, uh, and he actually talks about this idea of building a foundation. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verse 13. I don't know if you noticed, uh, I, I will say just on a side note, we noticed people noticed details on our Wednesday service that were surprising to us, like um, our shoes. Somebody had noticed our shoes on uh, the Wednesday night service. And so I, I don't know if you noticed, but I don't have any of my, my Bible notes in, my, none of my tabs to help me get there quick today. So I'm racing each of you to see who gets there first. Are you there? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's talking about, uh, in this text, he's talking about um, the work that he is being built on the church, and, and he's addressing this idea of people uh, investing in and, and doing the good works of the church, and uh, there's some argument about Apollos and, and, and who are they following, and all of these things, and Paul comes down to this particular verse in 1 Corinthians 3.13, where he's talking about each man's work. He's talking about the work that they all put in and how it's going to be evaluated. Look at verse uh, 13 of 1 Corinthians 3. Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. There's this purification process and a a testing process that happens in the day of the Lord, that all of the works that we've put forward, all the works that we've done uh, in the name of the church, in in the name of God, all of it's going to be tested. And the the craziest part is that our hearts will be revealed at that point. Where where was our heart at that point? Was it pure or was it self-focused? Was it, it, I think the terminologies are, are, you know, fine jewels, gold and silver, or is it hay, straw and stubble that just gets burnt up? That's going to be the process of, of a fire going through and testing our works and refining us. I think the sec- second aspect, and we mentioned it earlier, is the purifying, that fire will purify. This fire of the Lord brings purity to our lives. I've asked Gary if he would read 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9 for us this morning. Okay. I've already got mine on my uh, my phone here, so I'll give you... Just a minute if you want to get there. I guess I'll see how long it takes Shane to get there. Oh, the pressure is on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, First Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again 
to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So, um, yeah, as I, as I looked at this, I... It, it seems to me that we're being told that that, that testing, that purification, uh, will result in us being in a, in a better state to worship God and that we will be able to um, be seen by others as well as, as emissaries of God um, as having been purified. And um, it, it says that, you know, that, that gold perishes though it is tested by fire, but we may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's that testing. That's that, that fire um, and our, our hope that uh, by Christ's grace, if we're believing in him, we will come out of that in a refined state as opposed to being burned away like the stubble on the straw. Right. So um, I think that's what what's so amazing about that text is we were even just re uh, wrestling with it this morning as we were engaging that text. All three of us said, man, that this text in first Peter is just profound. It, it's it's not it's not just a, a simple additive to our discussion this morning, but it it has deep and, and meaningful uh, implications and applications to our life. I love verse five. That's part of the things that grabs me in that text is verse five where he actually says uh, that, that who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, that, that we are uh, ready to be revealed in the last times. The God in his glory and his sovereign power and all of his goodness is actually guarding our lives through these trials, through the testing, and he's guarding us for the hope of our salvation. He's the one doing it. So we, right. we have faith and we have hope because God's the one <laughs> that's doing the guarding at this point. Right. Um, and, and that what, a, what an amazing thing for us to think about, even in the culture, even in, even in the scare, a worldwide scare, if you will, of a virus that we're, that we're dealing with today, that God says he's guarding that faith. He's guarding that hope, that eternal perspective. And so when we think about the, the purifying work of the fire of God, that it's process, part of what it's doing is preparing us to be his people. It's preparing us for worship for his presence in eternity. That's just incredible. And so even today, we can trust him that he's doing that work, that he's preparing us even now, even this morning as we do this, which is part of why I've asked Craig to read Zechariah. Um, it, it talks a little bit about that preparation. Yeah. So if you turn to Zechariah 13, verses 7 through 9. Is that in the New Testament? <clears throat> no, it definitely is not. So, <laughs> Bible joke, Bible joke. <laughs> so it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as run refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people mm. and they will say the Lord is my God. What I find interesting, I did a little bit of research to find out this whole gold refining process that as it was done back in those days. And it was pretty fascinating because you basically take this gold, you crush it or put it into leaves, you pack it among old bricks that have been fired. 
and you crush it down, put it into a crucible, and you slowly start to heat this up over a 24-hour period until those crucibles are glowing. And it takes a very, very skilled refiner to do this. Um, if the refiner does it incorrectly, he can destroy all the gold or he's got to start the whole process over. When he's done, he breaks open the crucible, he crushes it again, and then it's melted down and the dross is taken off. So this is a very long, very complicated, very precise process. And the beauty of it is God is our refiner. So he knows exactly what we can take, how much heat we need in order to turn us into pure gold. And that's, that's what he's talking about. We seem to take this whole process and say, well, he's just going to cook us up, melt us down, and take off the dross. No, it's a long process. And even after all that fire and heat's been done, he crushes us again in order to come out with this pure gold product. But he's the one who made us. He knows exactly everything that goes on. So he's trustworthy. Yeah. And that's, that's what he's talking about here. Which ties us back into him guarding us in that in that First Peter passage that that he's protecting that process. He's intentionally doing those things. Isn't it interesting that in the text, so we we have this imagery of fire and we have this imagery of salt being salted with fire, and we know that that goes back to the sacrificial system that they would they would salt sacrifices before they were burnt in, in preparation. They would do those things, and 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 here we have uh, Mark referencing that salt is good. And in that culture, the, the value of salt was probably much more significant than it is, than it is today. We were talking earlier yeah. about the possibility of, of the Roman soldiers being paid in salt. Some of their, some of their wages would have been in salt. Um, the uses of, of salt, we, I grew up on a farm. We, we actually uh, farmed a draft horses for a season of our life. And so we would do loose hay, and it, then we started baling hay. And one of the things that you find if you're baling hay is that Washington, we were on the, the wet side, as I call it now. I never realized that that was even an option until I moved over here, um, but to the east side. Um, <laughs> but we would, at times, be putting hay away wet that had moisture on it. And so what we'd actually do is we would set up in our barns, and we would salt the layers between the hay, and it would help draw the moisture out and protect the the hay from rotting or or <laughs> in worst case scenario lighten up the, the barn and burning it down. Right. Um, so you know we knew salt from that, and and then there's many others: the preservative side, the the flavoring side, the purification side, the 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 use of cleaning stuff and and washing things out. We we do that. You probably would prescribe that for different kinds of infections, um, where people. Uh, my bride's always trying to get me to gargle salt. Because it helps with sinus infections. I mean, all kinds of different things that we could see the use. And yet at the time that this was written, it was even more valuable than what we would see it to be. And so here Mark's saying salt is good. And we know that salt has many purposes um, that we use it for, more that they would probably use it for at that time. But in this comment, of salt is good, he, he contrasts it with what happens if salt loses its saltiness. What happens in that moment if, if it loses its salt? Now, we talked a little bit about this um, as we were getting prepared this, this morning. You, you, salt really can't lose its saltiness, right? I mean, at, at that point, what, what is right. it good? It's, it's an element. Yeah, it's yeah. an element, and so unless you dissolve it down to where it's all gone, there's it's just going to be salty. So um, I guess part of what we what we need to wrestle through is what do you think he was trying to communicate to us as believers if he's saying salt's good, but if if you lose if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Well, there were there were things in the uh, in some of the stuff that I looked at that uh, the authors were describing how. Uh, it was pretty well known there were several, in, in ancient times, they referred to there being several kinds of salt in Israel, and it really what it had to do with was being diluted with impurity. Okay. So these, these weren't pure salt as we know it. Today it's easy for us with our modern labs. We get pure sodium chloride. We have salt. But uh, they were gathering it off the seashore, uh, wherever they could get it, and it was it had other things in it. One of the things that was mentioned by John MacArthur uh, was gypsum. And uh, he said that it was known, um, if I can find that, that, that it was actually known to be uh, imperceptibly mixed with gypsum, and it was worse than useless. Oh, <laughs> worse so, than useless. So, yeah, you know, how, what that might mean. I've been but, called that. <laughs> um, yeah, so 
I think that, that when they talk about it losing its saltiness, they're talking about being diluted out with impurity. Yeah. And so how would that, how do you think that impacts our, or, uh, let me say it this way, let's take a look at James mm-hmm. and consider how losing our saltiness or being polluted with, the, with contaminants or, or diluted with contaminants might af- affect us in our walks with the Lord. I've asked Craig to read James chapter 1, uh, verses 19 through 27. So if you'd turn there, see how. I am. So we'll see if he's any good at this. I am turning. Look at that. I'm just, I'm fanning it. Nice. So, James 1, 19 through 27. Mm-hmm. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Mm-hmm. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer but who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Yeah. See, three, I I think there's three things that we see in there. One, I love the reference. Uh, he said to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. I think when we think of the saltiness coming back, um, even in the context of the church, the salt being restored, it's through the word of God. That That's what's going to bring the salt of the church, the flavor of the church back, the the, the preservative of the church, if you will. It's the, it's the word of God implanted in our hearts. And then, he, and then he says to become doers, not just hearers. It's, it's not just a matter of us having the Word of God and, and being able to read it or, or even quote it. It's, it's about us acting on it, obeying it, living in that obedience and responding to that Word. And then I love how he ends this with this idea of religion, that if, if we're not going to control our tongues, if we're not going to bridle our, our, our tongues and, and keep it from deceiving our hearts, then our religion is worthless. And then he defines for us what true, pure religion looks like. It's when we care for the, those who can't care for themselves, the widows and orphans, those who are in need. If, if there was ever a time where this text kind of comes to life for the church, it's, it's now. In fact, in my life, I'm, I've been thinking, this is the first time I remember a time when the church actually had an opportunity to act like the church. When, when everything else around us in our culture said it's not a good idea. It's going to be a little dangerous. It's going to be a little risky for us to actually be the church, even a little bit more difficult for us to be the church and to meet the needs of those who are in need. And in context, um, orphans and widows, in the time that this was written, they were sort of the, uh, the castaways of yeah. society. Yep. Uh, so uh, at, at the beginning of our, our time, we... We were talking about God at work, and the text just brought this to me. But, you know, I've been seeing over the past week, both uh, in the small group text and uh, some of the things from church, uh, but also uh, on uh, secular apps like Next Door. Yep. Uh, there are a lot of instances out there that I've seen of people stepping up, looking for neighbors and looking for people that are, are uh, unable to get out, maybe can't do their own shopping, maybe can't find what they need. Yep. Um, and there's been a lot of offers to say, hey, let me know. Let's yeah, get out there. And, help. So, and I think that's awesome. That is, that's what James is talking about here, about religion that is pure and undefiled before God. That's been one of the highlights for me is watching our email stream and our, the people that are calling the church from within our body saying, how can we help? Mm-hmm. We want to help. Uh, in fact, it was one of the great challenges that we faced during the first week because we were kind of running around going, uh, we're not quite sure yet. 
That's a great question, and we're talk we're working on that. We're trying to get it organized. And and it was so cool because the body went and did the work of the body, even though we didn't have a good plan in place with all of our ducks in a row, which I don't know why the ducks have to be in a row. It should probably be sheep right now. Um, but the reality is, is that the church acted. Our little church acted, and people were being cared for and loved on. And and I think that that's part of the next the next challenge for us is yeah let's let's care for one another let's get this done and now the I believe the next question is so how do we have salt in our lives now to the rest of our community how do we we care for the lost we cared for the the widows and the orphans we care for those who are in need within the context of our body and and then the next door the the next neighbor the, the next space I think that's really the next challenge. Um, and when we think about that that question, how uh, have salt in your life or the challenge that the Lord gave us? I love James uh, partly because he helps to bring some co- some perspective to the conflicts that we experience in our lives. Um, I've asked Gary to read James chapter one, uh, verses two through four. Look at this. Yeah. The good thing is you I'm don't there. have to go very far because uh, this is just earlier in the same it. chapter that Craig was reading from. <laughs> uh, so starting with verse two, count it all joy, my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This goes back to, you know, it, it of course it's in the same chapter by James, but it goes back to what uh, Craig was reading just a little bit ago and talking about refining by fire, mm-hmm. this testing, and uh, it produces uh, what he's calling steadfastness here. But, that's that salt that we're we're looking for. Um, yeah. I thought it was interesting. Uh, again, I'm, you know, it's one of the commentaries that I that I thought was really well done was by uh, John MacArthur, and uh, he also uh, referenced back to uh, Matthew chapter five, verse thirteen, mm-hmm. where uh, Jesus. I th- I think that this may even be the same. Uh, same. I believe it's the same story. Story, but just you know, from a different author's perspective, but. Uh, so Matthew's writing instead of John, and Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the, and again, this is uh, Matthew five thirteen. you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And we were, we were talking about this earlier, that, uh, you know, it, we, we've said, yeah, salt is salt, and, and once it's gone, it, you can't, you can't take salt that has been defiled and, and make it pure salt again. But the good, cool thing is that, that God can do that with us. Right. He can restore that saltiness if it's, if it's lost by us. And uh, he will do that. It may not feel good to us. We may not enjoy the process, the refining, um, but it can happen. And uh, John MacArthur, again, you know, his conclusion, he says, I think our Lord simply says, you need to be unmixed in your obedience. And here's your command for today. Stop elevating yourself. Stop fighting. Stop the competition. Stop being the cause of temptation, such as the essence of radical discipleship then, to love extremely, to deal with sin severely, to sacrifice one's life wholly, and to obey fanatically. Mm -hmm. Um, I like that. So some good stuff there. Uh, So I think that's how he expects us to live with salt today. We are to be the salt for the rest of the world. Yeah. Just like we were just talking about, helping people out. And uh, that, um, <laughs> I've lost my, my vocabulary, sorry. The essence of, of true religion that Craig was just talking yeah. about, to watch after orphans and widows and uh, pure and undefiled religion. Yeah, and I, and I love how that ties back into the First Peter passage again, this idea of the tested genuineness of your faith. Right. God seems to have a great, plan to reveal to us where our faith is lacking by providing difficulties or trials or, or testings in those things so that we will grow and mature in our faith because he's a good father and he's protecting, he's guarding that, that hope, that salvation through this process. So the question we have for you today is how can you or how can we live with salt today? I want to encourage you over the next couple of days before Wednesday to give us some some ideas, some responses back uh, through uh, email or or on the Facebook, uh, through Facebook. But how can we live with salt today? I, I want to challenge each one of us to ask that question 
and to go before the Lord today and really wrestle with it. God, how do you want me to live with salt? How am I supposed to live in this way? Looking at James and, and having pure religion according to God. Um, looking at First Peter and recognizing how secure we are in that process of refinement, that it's through God, it's through his plan, and it's through him that we have this hope. And I love how the text wraps up because Mark doesn't leave us at just, hey, you guys, this is going to be tough, but God's doing this great thing. You should take sin seriously. But he wraps up the text with be at peace with one another. Have you guys noticed that uh, not a lot of peace going on right now? <laughs> Anybody? I don't know if, if you're doing anything on social media. I don't know if you've watched any of the videos that are going on or, around about shopping and other chaos that's happened. But the danger, the temptation for, for mankind is to be very selfish, very self-focused. And in those moments when we become self-focused, everyone else gets excluded and we become the most important thing. And that's, that's where we can really damage one another. And as the church, I think we are called to live at a different level. Not because of us, not because there's any less selfishness in me, but because God has called me and, and, and by his plan put that to death and has raised me in a new life in Christ. And so as I follow, as I live in obedience to God, I'm supposed to die to myself and become the servant of all. And so how that looks, what that looks like for us on a daily basis, I think is unique and different for each person. Um, I believe two things come out of this idea of being at peace with one another. It's a time for us to work together, to care for those who are in need, to, to show the world that even though we may have a difference of opinion about how this thing should be handled, whether you should quarantine indoors or whether we should just do the, what do they call it, herd immunity, where we get everybody mm -hmm. sick and see what happens, regardless of what your view is on how we should handle this, the church should have the ability to rise above and become a unified group of people that work together for the purposes of God. And the second piece of this is to exercise grace. Because we do have different opinions. We, we absolutely do. We all think that Ryan Anderson should get a haircut that matches yes, ours. Yes. We do. We were talking about that this morning. <laughs> now, you would say, Shane, what does that have to do with anything? Imagine, if you will, for just a minute, that you're one of the people that is in a nursing home and is very susceptible to this and you don't want to get sick, and there's people coming in all the time who have no regard for your health. What's your position? How do you feel? Imagine if you feel like there's not a lot of faith happening because people are, are living in fear and they're shutting themselves in. I, I know those things exist. I wrestle with the exa those exact things myself. How do we deal with that? How do we engage and show the gospel, the truth of the gospel, the love that Christ extends to people in this moment as we work to be at peace with one another? Now, what's the purpose of the peace? It is not just so that we all get along and everybody can sing kumbaya. It's for the sake of the gospel. I believe that we should see the value of the gospel right now as the highest calling. Paul says that he becomes all things to all people so that one might be saved. If he can do that, if he can do that, then I think at this time, in this moment, we could prayerfully consider what it looks like for us to be at peace with one another and to work together to exercise grace for the sake of the gospel as we care for those in need, as we become the church that at no point in my life have we ever had this opportunity that I remember. I don't remember a time where the world was shut down and restaurants were shut down and bars were shut down and, and, and entertain. I don't remember that time in any other virus scare. What a time for the church to be the church. What a time for the world to see how we love one another and how we extend love to those around us. I believe that's the call. Yeah, fire's coming. We will all be salted with fire. We're all going to be prepared for the worship of God as a sacrifice, like Romans 12 tells us in, in verses 1 and 2. We were all in that process of being prepared. And yet we're called to have salt in our lives and to live at peace, to be at peace with one another. How has God called you to live today? I want to encourage you to think about that and pray about that with me right now as Travis 
uh, prepares to lead us in our closing song. And then would you stay around for just a second? I just have a couple of closing thoughts that I want to encourage you with uh, this morning as we say goodbye till Wednesday. So, Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your example in our Savior Jesus, who in the midst of great torment, in the midst of great trials and persecution, God, he willfully obeyed you. He laid down his life, a life that was not guilty, of sin, and therefore it was it was an unjust death, suffering that was not warranted. And yet, God, in the midst of our trials, if we're really, really honest, as we see the darkness of our hearts, as we considered sin last week, the reality is is that um, that suffering that Christ suffered was meant for me. It justly meant for me. It was right for me to suffer those things. And yet, Father, by your grace, you have called us into new life. And as we saw in 1 Peter today, you guard our hope, our inheritance, our salvation. You guard that. And as we saw in James and in 1 Peter, you refine us and purify us and prepare us for that sacrifice. Oh, Lord, that we would see at this time that preparation that you have done in our hearts that you are preparing us for, that we, God, would live in obedience, we'd be doers of your word, and we would extend the grace of the gospel to our neighbors, that no one in our neighborhoods would be able to question whether or not we trust you. Not our government, not our resources, not our preparation, but we trust you. Because you are the one true God, the creator God of all the universe. And in that, we, God, can live with hope and joy and share the light of the gospel, even when there's great fear in and amongst our neighbors. May you be glorified, Father, in the worship of your church today. As we can't fellowship closely, but God, we are connected through you. We are your body. Whether we're in a building or not, we, the church, are your body, and we are directed to live in obedience. We're directed to serve and to care for those in need and to be your light. Help us do that this week, Father, as we desire to serve and honor you in your name. Amen. Would you all join me with your love never fails?
joy comes in the morning and when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me for my good you made all things work together for my good you made all things work together for my good you made all things work together for my There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid, because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. Your love Uh, thank you for that encouragement, and uh, what what a true statement that his love never fails. We we are hopeful, and our eyes are pointed to him. Uh, they should be, need to be turned to him. Uh, just uh, one thing I want to remind you of, if you know of someone in need or that uh, that needs help, that you're not able to meet that need, and, and you need to, uh, please contact the church, let us know. Um, we have people calling and asking how they can help, so we want to connect those people and those resources and and get be people connected there. So um, the second thing, let's remember to be praying for, uh, we've got a lot of people with small businesses in our church and in our community, and, and that those things are being deeply impacted by this, deeply impacted by this. Um, so we need to remember to lift them up in prayer. I just want to remind us that uh, in this time, in, in this challenge uh, of, of uh, the virus, but I mean, there's many other difficulties in life. It, it, once this is over, um, there are other things that challenge the church from being the church, from from faithfully serving and living in hope and living in obedience. Um, and and so there's we just need to be reminded to get our eyes on the Lord and to keep our eyes focused on Him. I'm going to leave you with Psalm 121 today. I'll give you a second to turn in your Bibles and uh, maybe maybe you want to highlight this this text for this week. Um, it was such an encouragement to me on Wednesday when we read it. It's been just going through my heart and through my head all week. And so um, I wanted to leave you again with this. Psalm 121, verse 1. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. God the Father is who's protecting and guarding us for eternity. And it's a hope and a truth that we can rest in. Father, would you go ahead of us and and prepare the way God, that our church, that we as your church would live in such a way that our neighbors, those who do not know you, who are terrified by the realities of of life right now, God, that they would look to those who believe and they would say there's something different about them. How do they have hope? How do they have joy in the midst of these things? Help us to be the light to this community. Help us to be your church and to care for those who are unable to care for themselves. Teach us what it means, Lord, to be at peace with one another and to have salt in our life. 
As we wrestle with that this week, Lord, I pray that you would guide each of our hearts to, to that truth and to the obedience that you have called us to in your name. Amen. May God bless you as you pursue him this week and uh, keep your eyes on him. See you on Wednesday.